Well, welcome back. Hope you got a good night's sleep. I know I did. Uh, we'll open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, uh, for this new day, for this opportunity to increase our understanding, to learn from you through brothers and sisters in Christ, and to uh, uh, find more ways to glorify you and um, minister to our Mormon neighbors. Um, thank you for our guest speakers again for the weekend, and thank you for all those in attendance. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've come to know Chip Thompson in bits and pieces, as Andy and I have traveled up many times to um, the uh, April conference in Salt Lake City, passed through Ephraim, where he's based, uh, he and his family and his ministry. Um, and uh, what a neat guy he is. He's just humble. He loves the Lord. He loves people. He loves Mormons. And he has a real knack for reaching <clears throat> the young people in that area. Their ministry is Kitty Corner to Snow College, so they have quite an outreach to that campus. And um, I don't know if he'll have the time to get into some of those stories, but um, it's a special treat for us to have uh, him have to come all this way to uh, grace us in this, um, this conference. So here's Chip Thompson. All right. Um, as Bob said, uh, my name is Chip Thompson. My wife is not in here right this minute, but J Brittany, stand up. This is my daughter, Brittany. She's in the ministry with us. She's, she's been uh, on staff with us in the past, and she's joining us again, so we're thankful for that. Um, this little handout, uh, hopefully everybody got a handout. If you didn't, raise your hand, and there's people with packets to give you. Um, this is our ministry. And I'm not going to take the time to read this to you, but let me just say that our ministry is a multifaceted ministry. Um, a lot of times we come to a conference like this and we talk, and people think that this is what we do. Well, we do this. This is, this is one of the things we do, but we also create training materials. And this is the Mormon scrapbook. Um, it's on our table in the back. Um, Concerned Christians here uses this a lot in, in their ministry. They're, I send more cases of scrapbooks to them than anybody else. And what this is, is it's a training manual. And when I moved to Utah 20 years ago, unlike, unlike uh, Sean and Lee and Kathy, I never was a Mormon. Um, I, I was bo born and raised in a Christian home, and I uh, became a, an actual believer in Christ when I was 21 years old, but I was raised in the Christian church and knew all about that. And so when I moved to Utah, I really didn't understand Mormonism very well. And I had to learn kind of through the school of hard knocks. And so what I've done with the Mormon scrapbook is I've created a very simple, hands-on training manual to train people that were like me, that wanted to be a witness to Mormons but didn't understand Mormonism, didn't understand how to talk to them, um, how to do that in a step-by-step -step process. And so this is uh, our training manual, and if you're in that position where you're saying, I don't understand this religion, I don't understand these people, I don't know how to approach this dis these discussions, the scrapbook is a workbook that will take you right through it. It's very simple. Um, I'm a simple-minded guy, so this is a simple-minded book, and it's not complicated or hard to understand, and so this is something for you to, to, to think about purchasing. Um, today what I want to do, and I, I, first of all, I want to say that I really, really appreciate the things that Sean said last night and the things that Lee and Kathy said last night. And what you're going to learn as you listen to Sean and to Lee and Kathy and to myself and to Andy and to others who will be speaking today is you're going to learn that we are all different. And our approach to Mormons, it's all different because Mormon people are individuals, and I'm an individual, and Sean's an individual, and Lee and Kathy are individuals, and we all approach things a little bit differently, but God uses our ability, what we are good at doing, and what we, what we kind of connect with, he puts us into the path of people that do the same thing. 
So he puts us into the path of people that we're able to connect with. And maybe somebody that I can't connect with, Lee would connect with perfectly. And maybe somebody that, that Lee can't connect with, Sean, would, would hit him right between the eyes with his discussion and would really get their attention. So God uses all different kinds of things. And I don't want you to get a mindset that somehow we're all doing the same thing because we're not. We all approach it differently. We all have different methods. And I want to say that there's two things I love in this world, which I think are the two things that Jesus loves the most. One of them is that Jesus loves the world. And Mormons are a part of that world, and he loves Mormons, and I love Mormon people. And God led us to Utah 20 years ago because we love Mormon people. And we want to be a witness to those Mormon people. We want to share the truth with them. And the other thing that God loves is God loves the church. And I don't care what the name on your church is, when the Bible talks about the church, the word church is ecclesia, which is the gathering or the assembly of believers. And wherever there are true believers that gather together in the name of Jesus Christ to worship him, to love him, to serve him, to teach his doctrines, Jesus Christ is there in the midst of them. And Jesus Christ loves the church. And he gave himself for the church, for the gathering of believers. And in this room today, this is the church. And I don't care what the name on your church is, but it's the people, it's the, it's the gathering, it's the group that's, that's the church, and Jesus Christ loves that. And so I want you to be encouraged that whatever church you attend, if they're a Bible-believing church that is following Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible, and are proclaiming his teachings, that church is a great church to bring Mormon people into. Because every church is, is like us. They're, churches are individuals. Churches are organisms, they're not organizations. And as Sean so clearly pointed out, that the Christian organization that has developed around our world, a lot of times that becomes corrupted. But the organism, which is the living part of the church, which is the people, Jesus loves that. And anywhere there's a gathering of those people that, that gather in Jesus Christ's name, that's where we want to bring Mormons if we can bring them. So um, today what I want to do, the, the conference that we're in today, the, the, the topic of it is, why are Mormons leaving? And they are. And let me encourage you with the fact that Mormons are leaving in droves from the Mormon religion, and the Mormon church can't deal with it. They don't know how to deal with it, and it's going to get worse and worse, which means for us as believers that we're going to have a harvest of, of Mormons. They're going to be coming out, and we are going to be harvesting these, these Mormons that are leaving, and we need to know how to do that. And I'll tell you, they, they asked us, what are, what are the reasons that Mormons are leaving? And from my perspective, and as I, as I think about our former Mormons in our church, and we've been in Utah for 20 years, right in the center, in the heart of Utah, um, in a little town called Ephraim, Utah, in rural Utah. When we moved there, there were no Christian churches in our entire valley. We now are the only functioning Christian church with a couple other Christian missionaries that have moved into our valley that are reaching out in their communities. But our church is the only functioning church with pastor deacon, Sunday school, all of, the, all of that. And um, when we moved there, there were no Christians there. It was basically devoid of Christianity. But today we have a thriving, growing Christian community and it's people are coming into our church every week we have visitors, which wasn't true 20 years ago. All right, so we're seeing that happen, and the Mormon church really doesn't know how to deal with it. They don't, don't know how to, uh, to uh, handle the problem, and I'll tell you what the problem is, is that we as believers are getting better at knowing how to talk to Mormons. That's one of the, one of the problems they have, so the things we're going to share with you today, they can't deal with. The other thing is the internet. The flood of the internet is seeping behind all of the closed doors in Mormon houses and they're watching what's going on on the internet and they're reading things on the internet in the privacy of their own home that they didn't have access to before and the Mormon church can't stop it. And so the Mormon church is in trouble. They're on a slippery slope right now. But what I want to tell you today is that every former Mormon that I know, one of the things that drew them out and drew them into Christianity was their love for Jesus. And I want to tell you right up front, I'm not saying we believe in the same Jesus, because we don't. The Mormon Jesus and the Christian Jesus are very different animals. But the Christian Jesus and the Mormon Jesus were both, in their mind, born in Bethlehem, walked in Palestine, did miracles, died on a cross, rose from the dead, 
those similarities we have when we start talking about who Jesus Christ is. In Mormonism, he's just their brother. In Mormonism, he's the brother of Lucifer. In Mormonism, he's, he's not God from eternity past to eternity future. He either is a God who became a God or he's going to become a God at some point in the future. And he, we're not going to worship him for all of eternity. He's just one of our brothers. So in Mormonism, it's a very different concept doctrinally than our, than our Jesus. But Mormons love Jesus. They're Jesus. And that is something we can use to challenge them. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you that one of the things you can do to help Mormons leave Mormonism is give them Jesus. Just plain give them Jesus. They're hungering for Jesus. They're thirsty for Jesus. They want the kind of relationship with Jesus that you and I have. And so give them Jesus. That's, that's the only way that they're going to... Um, that they're going to understand and come to an understanding of Jesus. So when these guys, okay, go to the next slide. When these guys show up at your house, how do you approach them? What do you do with them? And I want to tell you, the thing you don't do with them is you don't slam the door in their face and tell them to go away. I mean, this is an awesome opportunity. How often do people knock on your door so you can witness to them? That's what they're doing. They're knocking on your door saying, can we talk about religion with you? Why would we say no? And these guys, they're just 19, 18-year-old kids. They really like cookies and milk. <laughs> Invite them in and give them cookies and milk for Pete's sakes and witness to them. Share the truth with them. They're hungry for a relationship with Jesus. They think they're on a mission for Jesus. So give them Jesus, and that's all I'm going to say about this. I want, I want you to understand. Now, we're going to go through some topics in Mormonism, and are Mormons Christians, okay? According to Mormonism, they are. Now, I would say absolutely not. They're not Christians. They don't know the Christian gospel. They don't believe in the Christian Jesus. They don't believe in the Bible. But according to Mormonism, this is what Mormonism says, and this is the, the previous prophet of Mormonism, Gordon B. Hinckley, said this. We are Christians in a very real sense, and, and that is coming to be more and more widely recognized. Once upon a time, people everywhere said that we are not Christians. They have come to recognize that we are, and that we have a very vital and dynamic religion based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. We, of course, accept Jesus Christ as our leader and our king and our savior. Okay, so this is what Mormons will think, and if you ask any Mormon, I don't care who they are, are you guys Christians, what's their response going to be? Absolutely, we're Christians. We are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I say, okay, great. If you guys are Christians, then let's talk about it. And so there are some topics in what I would say Mormon doctrine, Christian doctrine, that we can discuss with them, that we can show them that what Jesus Christ taught is not the same as what their church is teaching. And if you guys are going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, you guys are going to be followers of Jesus Christ, then I want you to begin believing what Jesus Christ taught. Now, I'm going to give you the Mormon idea, the Mormon philosophy behind some of these topics. So first of all, this is what Mormons believe about repentance and forgiveness. And this is what um, their church teaches. The Lord said, By this you may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will forsake them. The forsaking of sin must be a permanent one. True repentance does not permit making the same mistake again. All right, now how many of you think that is what true repentance is? True repentance does not mean, it means you can never commit the same sin again. If you did commit the same sin again, you never were truly repentant. Okay, and then in Mormonism, they have these five um, requirements for forgiveness. The first one is that they need to realize the seriousness of the sin and pray in great humility and sorrow. The second one is they must forsake the sin and not repeat it. Okay, so you've, if you commit the sin again, you weren't repentant. The third one is you must confess the sin to the bishop or other church authority. So the church is the means of forgiveness. The fourth one is that you have to restore as far as possible that which was damaged. And the fifth one is you have to live all the commandments of the Lord. If you do those five things, then you can be forgiven. Now, how many of you think that's what Jesus taught? All right, so in your handouts, I have two handouts that I want you to look at. And they're basically identical. They're just used in a slightly different way. 
So the Jesus survey and the challenge, the Jesus challenge, okay? These two documents are the same. The questions are the same and the answers are the same. The Jesus survey, you would actually sit down and do with a Mormon one step at a time. You would go through the questions with them, have them answer the questions, then you would go through the answers with them. It would be like doing a survey. The Jesus challenge would be a friend or a person that says, well, I don't have time to do a survey. Oh, well, here, then do it yourself. You know, promise me, though, the answers are on the back. Promise me you won't look at the answers till you do all the questions first. If you do that, then take it and check it out, and let's see, how, see what your understanding of the teachings of Jesus Christ is. All right, now let me show you where this little quote came from. Um, this is a book called The Miracle of Forgiveness. If you're going to talk to Mormons, you have to use their literature. It's, in, it's, the, it's like what Lee was talking about last night. Using their sources is imperative to talk to Mormons. And this is a little pamphlet that... Uh, that I have on my back table back there. This is called Repentance Brings Forgiveness. I bought this in the LDS Distribution Center yesterday here in Mesa. Not this one, but the ones that are on the back table. And this is where these quotes came from. Okay, so I can show them, this is what your church teaches, this is what you believe, right? And I can go through the five steps of repentance. In fact, you can even ask them, go through the five steps of repentance for me. What are they? Number one, what? Number two, go right through them because most Mormons would be able to do that, okay? Um, so that's where the quotes come from. And so these are my tools that I use with Mormon people. I use the miracle forgiveness. And I talk with them. Okay, so let's look at the first question. This is what Mormons believe about repentance. So the first question on your, on your Jesus survey or on your Jesus challenge is this. Jesus demonstrated on several occasions that even the most wicked of sinners would be forgiven. A, eventually through a repentance process which would lead them to righteous living or B, immediately by simply coming to Jesus and exercising a humble faith in him. Now, which one did Jesus teach? B, what, how, how is a Mormon going to answer that? A. Okay, so what we're going to do with this survey is we're going to reveal to them that what their church is teaching them ain't what Jesus taught. And if your church is the church of Jesus Christ, I think that needs to change. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're a missionary of Jesus, I think what you're teaching people needs to change and agree with Jesus. Logical? Make sense? Okay, the next one. Um, okay, the pre-existence or the pre-mortal life. Um, in uh, Mormonism, they believe we all existed. How many of you received this little handout? Heavenly Father's Plan of Salvation. Did you guys get this? Okay, if you didn't get this, raise your hand. And we'll pass out some more of these. Okay, so there's a... They're black and white, though. They're black and white. Heavenly Father's plan of salvation. If he didn't get them, there's going to be some guys that are going to come around. All right, now this is, I bought this yesterday at the, at the Deseret Bookstore. So this is the Mormon bookstore right over by the temple, okay? This is the Mormon church's Heavenly Father's plan of salvation. Look at it and tell me what's missing. Jesus. Heavenly Father's plan of salvation bought in the Mormon bookstore doesn't mention Jesus. Because Jesus really isn't important. All right, no atonement on the back, no Jesus on the front. Lucifer is mentioned three times, but no Jesus. Okay, so they're passing them out to you. You'll get one. All right, so we use this as a tool to get into conversations with LDS people. It's a very interesting tool to use, but they, they give lip service to Jesus, but they don't really believe in Jesus. So in Mormonism, they believe that before we were born on earth, we lived in the presence of our Heavenly Father and His Spirit children as his spirit children. So they believe we all are literally the sons and daughters spiritually of a heavenly father and a heavenly mother that gave birth to us in heaven. All right, so that's the LDS view of the pre-existence. Now read number two, question number two with me. In regard to pre-existence, Jesus stated that, A, he was the only person who had pre-existed in the presence of the Father and had come down to the earth, or B, we had all pre-existed with our Father in heaven and should view the entire human race as sons and daughters of God. Which did Jesus teach? Jesus taught, A, he was the only person, okay? None of us pre-existed with the Father, and the answers to that are all on the back. This is earth-shattering for Mormon people. All right, let's look at the next question. Okay, temple marriage, or the principle of eternal marriage. This is what we call 
the last one, the preexistence, the principle of eternal marriage, we, we call these um, the pillars of Mormonism. This is what their church stands upon, these pillars. The preexistence is one of them. The, pre, the, the principle of eternal marriage is the other one. This is what their church teaches. The prophets have uniformly taught that God's great plan for the blessings of his children is eternal marriage. LDS president Howard W. Hunter describes celestial marriage as the crowning gospel ordinance. Okay, so how important is that in Mormonism? The prophets have uniformly taught this doctrine, and this is the crowning ordinance of Jesus Christ's gospel. All right, so look at the next question. True or false? Jesus taught his followers the sanctity and importance of an eternal marriage relationship which, which would extend far beyond the future resurrection. True or false? False. Jesus never talked about that. That's not a doctrine Jesus ever mentioned, not in the Bible or in the Book of Mormon. Never. So where did that doctrine come from? Came from Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, where it came from. Okay, so that's where it came from. All right, let's keep going. The next one is priesthood authority. This is another pillar we call a pillar of Mormonism. Mormonism is all about priesthood. You must have the Aaronic priesthood. You must have the Melchizedek priesthood. You must be a high priesthood holder. Lee talked about that last night, how important it was for him that he was a high priesthood holder in the Mormon church. All right. The priesthood is the, is the eternal power and authority of God. God gives priesthood authority to worthy males of the church, uh, members of the church, so that they can act in his name for the salvation of his children. And then they show, you go to Temple Square, you'll see these statues John the Baptist coming back in a, as a resurrected being to give the Aaronic priesthood to, to Joseph Smith. And then Peter, James, and John coming back as glorified personages to give the Melchizedek priesthood to Joseph Smith. And this is really important in the Mormon church. So let's look at question number four. In regard to priesthood, Jesus Christ spoke often with his disciples about the importance of the priesthood and ordained them with priesthood authority to act in his name, or B, never spoke about the importance of any priesthood, nor is it recorded that he ordained his apostles with priesthood authority, which is true. B, Jesus never talked about the priesthood. And it's only mentioned briefly in two places in the New Testament where we're called priests to our God, that we are a kingdom of priests to our God. And in both of those places, the people being addressed are Gentiles, which was shocking to the Jews. Okay, that, that a Gentile could be called a priest? Impossible. I mean, not even all the Jews could be called priests. You had to be in the tribe of Levi. You had to be of the family of Aaron to be a high priest. And yet, the disciples in the New Testament are including the whole Gentile nations, all the Gentile nations, into this priesthood that's in Jesus Christ. Because now, even the Gentiles can serve God. And the only place that the idea of the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood is discussed in detail in the New Testament at all is in the book of Hebrews. Now, who do you think the book of Hebrews was written to? The Hebrews, the Jews, okay? And why is that an important topic for the Jews? Because it was only the Jewish nation that held the priesthood. Only the tribe of Levi that held the priesthood. Only the Aaronic priests, the lineage of Aaron could be, could be high priests. And so this discussion of priesthood is in the book of Hebrews. But in the book of Hebrews, the Aaronic priesthood is said to be obsolete, completely of no value anymore at all. And then it discusses a priest, singular, one, who would come after the order of Melchizedek, who was Jesus Christ himself. Nobody else, just Jesus, was the one who came after Melchizedek to be the Melchizedek high priest for us. And that's the only mention of it in the whole New Testament. And yet in Mormonism, it is the important doctrine. Okay, so Jesus never talked about it. Okay, the next one. The great apostasy, and this, if you don't know what this is, it means that all of the Christian churches went completely awry. Every, every Christian church on earth became completely apostate, that all of them were wrong, all of their creeds were an abomination in God's sight, all of their professors had become corrupt. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. All of Christianity had, got, had gotten to that state. That's the great apostasy, okay? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has proclaimed to the world that there was an apostasy of the church founded by Jesus. This is a fundamental belief of the Latter-day Saints. If there had not been an apostasy, there would have been no need for a restoration, which is true. This is a pillar of Mormon faith. They have to believe in the great apostasy. All right, so number five, 
Look at your questions. Jesus said that after his resurrection, the church would fall into a state of total apostasy because wicked men would arise who would take away the many plain and precious truths that he had taught. True or false? Jesus said the opposite. And if you believe Jesus, and you can say this to your LDS friends that come knock on your door, if you believe Jesus, you can't believe in a great apostasy. Because if the great apostasy happened, then Jesus is a false prophet. And the prophecies that Jesus gives in the answers on the back, there's no way that could have happened. Or Jesus didn't keep his promises to the church. And this will bother them big time. It's a big problem. Okay, the next one, this is the final question, has to do with hell. Okay, in Mormonism, hell really has a very different concept than it does here. All right, so let me read this. In the spirit prison are those who reject the gospel after it was preached to them. These spirits suffer in a condition known as hell. They, these are they who are liars and sorcerers and adulterers and whoremongers and whosoever loves and makes a lie, and they reject Jesus. Now, in this room, we have some of these people. We have some former adulterers. We have some former fornicators. We have some sorcerers. We we've have, in this room, people that used to be those things that have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, but this right here says these are the sorcerers and the adulterers and the whoremongers that didn't accept Jesus Christ, okay? After suffering for their sins, they will be allowed through the atonement of Jesus Christ to inherit the lowest degree of glory, which is the celestial kingdom. So they're going to get to go to heaven, to the lowest heaven in Mormonism. So Mormons don't really believe that hell is an eternal place except for one group of people. And there's only one group of people, a very small number of people, that will go to hell. So Lee, would you raise your hand back there? Lee is one of those. <laughs> In order to be an apostate that would be worthy of going to outer darkness or where the devil's going to be for all eternity, you would have had to do what Lee did. Be in the, in the church, a temple member, believer in all of the doctrines of the Mormon church, and then come out and begin fighting against it, which is what Lee is doing. He's fighting against the doctrines of this false religion, and those are the only ones that will end up in hell. All right, so final question. Jesus taught that after death, people will be given a second chance to receive the gospel. Those who repent can move from a place of tortured remorse to a place of peace and comfort. True or false? False. All right, but can you see that if you do this with an LDS person, how many of these are they going to get right? Okay, typically, and I've done a lot of these with LDS people, typically they'll miss five out of six. They'll accidentally get one right. Okay? Now, this is an eye-opener to a Mormon. This is a shock to them. You mean Jesus didn't teach any of these doctrines? No, this is what Jesus taught. Check it out. And so that's all this is. It's a tool. It's a, it's a seed planter. It's a way of getting into a conversation with them and saying, if you want to believe Jesus, then you've got to believe Jesus. And you can't be in this church and believe in Jesus. It's just it won't work. It's impossible. All right? Okay, so let me do something else with you. And I'm going to have Andy come up here. Andy's going to be my Mormon today. And this is another one of our handouts, and it's the same. But it's a different way of interacting. And if the Mormon missionaries knock on your door... You can do this with them. This is really easy because it's, it's labeled number one, number two, number three, number four, and let's talk about it. Okay, so it's very simple. And we have a whole bunch of these on our table. This is our ministry, okay, to teach people how to get into these kind of conversations with Mormons. So Andy has just knocked on my door, and other than the beard, he is the good little Mormon missionary, okay? And so, hi, my name's Chip. What's your name? I'm Elder Poland. Elder, Elder Poland, so nice to meet you. What's your first name? Uh, well, uh, we don't give out our first names. I, I'm Elder Poland. So, so, but you know what? You're not my elder. <laughs> Okay. You're younger. I, I, so if it's okay with you, I'm going to call you Younger Poland. Is that all right with you? <laughs> and that's exactly how they respond to that comment. Because uh, uh, I'm your elder, so I'm, I'm the elder. You're going to be the younger, so you're Younger Poland. Is that all right with you? Okay. And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I guess whatever. Okay, so, so here, I've got a question for you. And this is great. Do this with them. Laugh with them. 
Invite them in. Give them cookies and milk. Make a friendship with them. Build a relationship with them. So I've got a question for you because you're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? Yes. Okay, so this is something that Gordon B. Hinckley said. Would you read that? Uh, uh, We are Christians in a very real sense. Sounds good. Uh, We have a very vital and dynamic religion based on the teachings of Jesus. Hmm? Okay, so you would agree with that. Yeah. So you believe that your church is a Christian church. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's, it's Christian because it's based on the teachings oh, of Jesus. It's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay, great, great. Okay. okay, so another question for you. Would you also agree that every true Christian church must, must base its doctrines on the teachings of Jesus? Would that be a true statement? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, so let me ask you another thing here. This is, this is a doctrine that I believe your church teaches, and I think that you'll agree with this. So, but, so tell me if you agree with this statement, so read that to me. All right. Uh, The prophets have uniformly taught that God's great plan for the blessings of his children is eternal marriage. President Howard W. Hunter described celestial marriage as the crowning gospel ordinance. Okay. So do you agree with that? Oh, yeah. So this is something that your... Families can be together forever, and that's how, through marriage. Okay. So this is something that your prophets have uniformly Mm -hmm. taught. Oh, yeah. Okay. And this is the crowning ordinance of Jesus Christ's gospel. Absolutely. Okay. So here's my question, because this is what I don't understand understand about this, because I am a believer in Jesus. And I follow Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. I've given my life to Jesus Christ. So here's my question. Okay. okay. Can eternal marriage be the crowning ordinance of Jesus Christ's gospel if Jesus never taught it? Well, uh, I'm sure that he did teach it. I mean, I, I would be surprised if he didn't. Well, could you show me? I mean, here. This is, <laughs> this is your Bible. Okay, this is one of your Bibles. Can you show me where Jesus Christ taught that anywhere? Just I, I, eternal marriage. Eternal marriage. I'd like for you to know where that, dis, that doctrine is discussed by uh, Jesus anywhere. Or, or you could even... Here. Here's the Book of Mormon, too. Okay? So you could even use the Book of Mormon and show me anywhere where Jesus taught that in the Bible or in the Book of Mormon. Uh, or, or anybody that ever got married in a temple. Anywhere. Well, I, I mean... I don't think... I can't think of anything out of the Bible. Um, I, I know there's some passages in the Doctrine and Covenants. Would you take... Those? Well, <laughs> here's my, here's, I know your, uh-huh. I know the Latter-day prophets have taught this doctrine. Okay. But we've got ancient prophets, and your church, isn't your church supposed, supposed to be like a restoration of the gospel? Yeah. What does that mean, restoration? Uh, to bring back to its original state. Okay, to bring it back. So where did the ancient prophets teach that? If you're bringing it back to the original state, I want to know where the ancient prophets taught so that. somewhere in the Book of Mormon or the Bible? Anywhere. Okay. I mean, aren't, um, uh, let me show you this. Okay. In the beginning of the Book of Mormon... The introduction, it says this, that the Book of Mormon is a volume of Holy Scripture comparable to the Bible. It is a record of God's dealings with the ancient inhabitants of the Americas and contains, as does the Bible, the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Yeah. Okay, so if they both contain the fullness of the everlasting gospel, and this is the crowning gospel ordinance, then show it to me. Where would, where would it be? Uh, well, now, I'm going gonna, gonna to tell you right up front so that we don't take too long here. It ain't there. Yeah. And he ain't going to be able to find it. Okay, so I'm going to say, well, now let me show you something, because in the Bible, there is one place where this topic comes up. I mean, this is the perfect opportunity for Jesus to go into a discourse on eternal marriage, because the topic comes up right here, and this is in Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 30, and it says this, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master... Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, having no issue, uh, having no issue, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died all... Now, she must have been a bad cook or something. (laughs) That's, I guess. I mean, she killed off seven husbands. Uh, this This can't be normal. But anyway, this is what happened, all right? Therefore, and this is the question, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven, for they all had her? Now, now let's put this into modern day terms, all okay. right? So let's say in your church, there's a woman in your church that's a really bad cook and kills off seven husbands, okay? And let's say that happens. Uh-huh. So in the resurrection, which husband would she be married to? Well, I would say the first one, because that's the one she probably got sealed to, and the rest of them were just for time. What if she didn't get sealed to the first one? Well, so which to- one would she be with then? Well, if she didn't get sealed to any of them, then she wouldn't be with any of them. Well, what if she got sealed to the third one? Then she would be with a third one. Okay, so that should be the, uh, that should be the answer, right? right uh-huh. To this answer. Okay, yeah. so, but I want to show you what Jesus said. Okay. Because Jesus didn't go that direction at all. This is what Jesus said. 
Jesus answered them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels of God in heaven. And I think it's interesting that Jesus says, You err, not knowing the scriptures. And I'm going to tell you that eternal marriage isn't in the scriptures. Right. So you're in error to believe that that's something Jesus taught because it's not in the scriptures. You see that. Okay, now that, that's, what they're, that's exactly what they're going to do. Um, they're going to get their Bible out. They're going, to start, they're going to read the whole context of it. They're going to search through there. And then I'm going to say, now, this is just one topic. And, and I'm not trying to destroy your faith in Jesus because I am a devout believer in Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus when I was 21 years old. I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. And, I, and see what he's doing? That's exactly what they're going to be doing. They're going to be nodding their head. Yeah, and, and what I want is I want you to become a follower of Jesus and believe what Jesus taught, not what some guy said Jesus taught. And I want to show you in here, there's three other topics. There is the topic of the preexistence. And as I study what Jesus taught, he taught the opposite. You need to read this. Okay, when I study the great apostasy of the church, it couldn't have happened. If Jesus was a true prophet of God, if he really spoke the truth, it couldn't have happened. And then the priesthood, Jesus never talked about the priesthood. How important is the priesthood to you? They have to have the priesthood. But Jesus didn't. Hmm. And, and Jesus never talked about it with his disciples. So I, I'd like for you to take this home and study it. Would you be willing to do that? Sure. I, I think I could maybe come up with some answers for you, too. That would be great. You go home and study it this week, and then you come back next week with some answers. Okay. Thank you, man. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, how many of you think you could do that? I mean, how hard is that? One, two, three, four, and then let's talk about it. It's not that hard, and that's what, we, that's what our ministry specializes in. Can you go to the next slide? Our ministry specializes in creating discussion starters, um, topics to talk through Mormon, uh, about with Mormons. And let me tell you, when you get to this point where you've taken them through and you've showed them that the Bible doesn't agree with your doctrine, what do you think their next response is going to be? Well, you know what? You know, I know you guys believe in the Bible with all your heart, but you know, you, you know, don't you, that plain and precious truths, you know, were removed from the, I mean, it's not the same today as it was when Jesus Christ, you know that, right? Well, what should be your response to that? No, I don't know that. Tell me about it. Okay, well, in the dark ages, there was a guy named Constantine who was a really bad guy and, and the Catholic Church and the, they just, pre, corrupt priests, they just took things out of the Bible that they didn't believe in. I said, so, you know what, I know that's what you've been taught, but I don't, that's not true. And I, I can prove it to you. Would you let me prove that to you? What, what, would you guys out there, would you let me prove this to you? Sometimes when I'm on the street, I'm talking to you that big of a group of people. Would you guys, would you be willing to let me show you that the Bible really is trustworthy? I can prove it to you. Would you be willing to let me do that? No, you couldn't do that. You know, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, that's what happens on the street. Okay, so let me do this, okay? So this is where it comes from. So grab this one out, the plain and precious truths. And this is, I'm going to tell you how you can challenge and show a Mormon person that the Bible could not have been corrupted the way the Book of Mormon says. Impossible. And they will agree with you when you're done. Impossible is what they will say when you're done with this. All right, so number one, this is where it comes from. This is where the doctrine comes from, which is the challenge to us as Christians. And it's 1 Nephi chapter 13, and I want you to follow along while I read this. It says, thou hast beheld that the book, in the context in which we're reading is the Bible, proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew. It actually proceeded from the mouth of many Jews, but we're not going to go there. And, then it and, and when it proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew, it contained the fullness of the gospel of the Lord, of whom the twelve apostles bear record. And they bear, they bear record according to the truth which is in the Lamb of God. Wherefore, these things go forth from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles. And that's important, and I underlined it there. When it was in the hands of the apostles, it was in purity. It hadn't been corrupted yet, okay? 
um, and to the Gentiles, according to the truth which is, in, which is in God. And after, now that's important, after they go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb from the Jews unto the Gentiles, thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church, which is most abominable above all other churches. For behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. Now that's the reason that Mormons believe the Bible has, is missing plain and precious truths. It's because it's in the Book of Mormon. All right? So what's the problem with that? Well, the first problem with that is that it disagrees with what God says about his own word. And in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, God says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God is never going to be lost to mankind because we need it. God wouldn't allow it to be lost. God's in control of that. Jesus Christ, in Matthew 24, actually in every, all four Gospels, he says this. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Did the gospel of Jesus Christ ever pass away from our earth to where the knowledge wasn't there for people to learn it? No, there's been believers ever since the time of Jesus. The church has done exactly what Jesus Christ said it would do. It has grown and it has grown and has grown until it has filled the whole earth is what Christianity has done. All right. So that's a problem. It disagrees with what God says about his own word, what Jesus says about his own words. The second problem is this. Um, the manuscript and historical evidences will prove that 1 Nephi 13 could not be true. All right, The Lord's apostles lived and wrote the New Testament letters in the first century. If 1 Nephi 13 is correct, the entire Bible was in purity until after 100 A.D. Now, turn your paper over, and I've got a Bible timeline there for you to look at. And I show this to Mormons. I say, okay, now here's, here's a timeline of the Bible, and this is the time we're talking about. The time of the apostles, from about the time of the cross until about 100 A.D., that's the time we're looking at right here that we're talking about in 1 Nephi 13. The Bible's pure during the time of the apostles. It's not till after the death of the apostles that any corruption could have taken place in, our, in, a, in the Bible. All right? And they're not going to disagree with that. They're going to agree. Okay, I agree with that. Okay, so have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Do you know what they are? They are documents that were buried in the first century. Now, why were they buried? Okay, now look at the timeline again. <clears throat> See 70 AD right there? 70 AD is about the time they were buried. They were buried in about 67 AD. All right, now look at this. This is right in the middle of the time when the apostles were in complete control of the church. This was the strength of the Jewish church right then. All right? And they were buried right at that moment in history because the Romans came into Jerusalem and they sacked it. They destroyed Jerusalem. They knocked the temple off the Temple Mount. They burned it with fire. They began to persecute the Jews and persecute the Christians. And when, they, when the Romans marched down through the Jordan Valley, the Qumran community buried the Dead Sea Scrolls in caves and sealed them. And they remained sealed until 1947. So we've got documents that predate when the corruption the Book of Mormon's talking about happened. So tell, you tell me, if uh, some bad guy came along later and started changing the Old Testament documents, what would we have to do to find out what the changes were? It's real simple. Look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because every book in the Old Testament is represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the exception of possibly Esther. And so all we have to do is look at, compare the Dead Sea Scrolls with the later manuscripts and see if there's any doctrines, any commandments, any principles that were changed. How many doctrines, principles, commandments do you think were changed? Zero. We can prove it. We've got the evidence. We can lay it on the table. No question about it. All right, what about the New Testament? It's a little different, right? Okay, the New Testament didn't get buried in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So what happened to the New Testament? Well, look at the map. See this map? This is what we call the Roman diaspora, or the dispersion of the Jews from their ancestral homeland, which was Israel. But it was much more than that. It was the persecution of the early Christian church, which, what, what, which persecution went from about 70 A.D. all the way to 325 A.D. when Christianity was decriminalized in the Roman Empire. So persecution was going on. And where do you think the Christians fled? Well, everywhere. 
The ones that were in Italy and Greece fled north into Europe. The ones that were in Jerusalem, some people fled north into ancient Armenia, which is modern-day Turkey. Some of them fled south into North Africa. Okay, And they took with them, we know, they took with them the letters of the apostles. We know they did because we have three basic families of Greek manuscripts that are the New Testament. We have the Western text, the European text. We have the Byzantine text, the Armenian text. We have the, the Coptic text or the, the Alexandrian text, which comes from down in, 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 in Africa. And those texts, when they're compared, there's nothing missing. And how many, how many ancient Greek manuscripts do you think we have in our possession today? Five thousand seven hundred and eighty, to my last count, and it's in written in here. Five thousand seven hundred and eighty ancient hand copied Greek manuscripts. Some of them from the second century, some from the third, the fourth, the fifth, all the way up to the invention of the printing press. And when you compare all of those manuscripts over a million pages of hand copied Greek New Testament manuscripts, you compare all of those manuscripts. How many doctrines, how many commandments, how many principles are missing or changed? None. There are variants in the text. I, I'm, I'm not going to try to hide that. There are word variants, spelling variants, grammar variants, inversion of words, sentences that were accidentally misplaced or, double, or copied twice. But do any of those variants change one doctrine, one commandment, one principle in the New Testament? So here's what we can say. Never was there a sinister manipulation of the text, period. There were mistakes, but no sinister manipulation of the text. So let me ask you, okay? Take all of this into account, and you're a bad guy. Let's just say 150 AD, you're a bad guy. And you want to change the deity of Christ in the New Testament. So how are you going to do it? You're going to get on your donkey or your camel, and you're going to start riding around the Roman Empire, which is basically all of Europe, North Africa, Asia Minor. You're going to ride your donkey around the Roman Empire. You're going to meet people that you've never met before that are Christians, that are hiding, that have their, their sacred documents, and you're going to convince them as a complete stranger that, you're, that they should let you alter their documents. How many of you think that could possibly happen? So tell me what it would be. Impos impossible. Exactly. It would be impossible. And that's exactly how an LDS crowd responds to me. It would be impossible. So it didn't happen. All right? It didn't happen. All right. So we're um, basically done for our morning's talk. And um, I want you to know we have a whole bunch of these. This... And this, and this, and we've got others. This is another one that is a way to challenge the fact that the Christians didn't change the Bible, but the Mormon church sure did. And let me show you how the Mormon church changed the Bible. And this handout goes with these books. And it's really important to be able to show them in their own books, or at least into one, at least one of their books, or a couple of their books, where these differences took place. And so I'm telling you, it's really important for, to you, for to you to use their own books. These books over here are great tools. You can get into a discussion with any Mormon just by using these tools. Uh, teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. There are so many great things you can talk about in this book. Gospel principles. Um, doctrines of salvation. This is one Lee brought up yesterday. History of the Church, Volume 6. There's so many. And... I'm just giving you the ones I like to use. There are others. So use their own scriptures. Use their own documents. Use their own literature to talk to them. Use their own... Um, you should use the Bible and the Book of Mormon to talk to them. Use the Doctrine and Covenants to talk to them. That's what they will listen to. Um, their Bible is exactly the same as your King James Bible, if you still use it. It hasn't been altered at all. The alterations that Joseph Smith made are only in the footnotes. You can show them the footnotes and show them the big alterations that Joseph Smith made. So this is what I'm encouraging you to do. And this is the ministry of, of Tri-Grace Ministries, is to create these kind of tools 
and supply them to people like you so that you can then go and talk to Mormon people without all the 20 years of, of uh, education that we've had in Utah, you can take our ideas and get into these great conversations and plant these seeds in the lives of Mormon people. Um, Kathy last night, what she said was so awesome. She talked about all the seeds that got planted in her life. Sean talked about the seeds that got planted in his life and how those seeds took root. These are just seeds. And I thought what Kathy said was so excellent when she said, it's not the sower, it's the seed. It's the truth. It's the word of God. That's the seed. They're going to forget who you are. Just like Sean, just like Kathy, just, they don't remember who these people were. The people I've talked to on the streets, they'll never in a million years remember who I am until we get to heaven someday. And then they're going to go, ah, oh, you were the guy that planted that seed in my mind that I couldn't sleep for weeks afterwards. But it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit doing the work. And so I want to encourage you to invest. If you're going to be good at witnessing to Mormons, invest into the tools. Um, get these things. Learn how to use them. And then when they knock on your door, come on in, guys. I've got some cookies and warm milk for you. And you just, I just want to talk to you. And I, uh, yeah, share, you share your missionary lesson with me. And then I've got a missionary lesson for you. So I'll listen to your missionary lesson, and then let me share my missionary lesson with you. Is that, is that a deal? Okay, come on in. And then do it with them. And this is your opportunity to be a witness. All right. Again, thank you, Bob and Andy, for allowing us to come and be a part of this conference. And we'll be back at our table, so come back and check out our stuff.